Uh, welcome, everybody, on behalf of the, uh, the Institute and also the Commission representation here. We're, we're co-hosting this event uh, today. Uh, it's become an, an, an annual event uh, focusing on the uh, country-specific recommendations around the, the broader European semester piece. Uh, all feeds into helping to improve the quality of policy making and, and its implementation. Um, something particularly important, I think, for small other economies like Ireland. We've certainly had a roller coaster. Our economic history over the past number of decades has been something of a roller coaster. Uh, a lot of that we can't influence, but the things we can influence are things here at home in the domestic policy space. And good to have uh, uh, ideas and thoughts coming from outsiders to give a fresh perspective on all of that. So without further ado, uh, we have two keynote speakers today. Let me hand over to our first speaker, the uh, uh, Minister, uh, Regina Doherty, TD. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, everybody, for um, the invitation to speak here today. I think it's fair to say that the Institute has a very strong track record of providing a very valuable platform um, of exchange and ideas <coughs> with your so just last year, the IAEA published a study assessing the impact of the country's specific recommendations, which I know is definitely going to inform today's seminar. I want to welcome the initiative um, teaming up with the European Commission today to continue to raise the profile of the renewed, thankfully, uh, social Europe. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome Director Jen Hughes Court to Ireland. It's not his first visit, I'm told, but hopefully it won't be his last. And he's, so he's only in his role since March. He's shown in our discussions today to be exceptionally open engaging voice on progressing social and employment policies, not just in Ireland, but across the EU. Uh, the country-specific recommendations as part of the semester process have now been used at EU level since 2011 and in Ireland since 2014. And the process has certainly evolved over the years with changes to the annual timelines given to member states, and it gives a greater opportunity to discuss the Commission's proposals. I think in addition, the Commission has come to understand the profound policy changes at a national level can take significantly longer than the 12 to 18 month window that was originally envisaged under the CSO process. Uh, I think the process is not a perfect one. There's no member state that's fully implementing each and every recommendation, but the record does show that the Commission and the member states have learned lessons from the European semester process and adjusted each of our own processes accordingly. And this has led to Ireland and other member states committing to a cycle of continuous and ongoing reforms that we all believe are necessary to ensure that the European Union remains relevant in people's lives from a social perspective while continuing to drive uh, economic prosperity in all of our states. The semester process has genuine strong support in Ireland. The process benefits greatly from the two-way dialogue with a view to shared analysis and understanding of all of the ideas that we discuss with each other. And we believe that this dialogue with member states is essential and will continue to improve both the quality and the implementation of each and every recommendation. One aspect of the semester process that tends to get overlooked by those looking in from the outside is the capacity of member states to learn from each other. And I think both our successes and equally our mistakes are as important as each other to learn from each other. Um, our exchanges of best practices, of policy innovations, I think sometimes they're hard to quantify and therefore sometimes they're easy to dismiss as inconsequential. But nonetheless, I think they're a valuable learning tool for a national administration in an increasingly complex social policy environment. Last year's IIEA report on the CSRs recognized the increased emphasis in recent years on the CSRs relating to social and employment issues, which is my own brief. And I think some commentators have suggested that the early years of the semester process involved the absorption of social policy into macroeconomic uh, policies. And I think it's now fair to say that we're witnessing a, a correction. And this ties into President Juncker's renewed vigour in promoting social Europe, uh, where, as he has stated, we have a common understanding of what is socially fair in our single market. I'd like to turn to the 2018 CSRs for Ireland. They were published on the 23rd of May, and these recommendations are discussed and being dissected by member state officials in the Commission as we meet here today at this very moment. And I'll be joining with my ministerial colleagues in Luxembourg later on this month at the ESCO ministerial meeting to debate, but ultimately to decide and endorse all member states' employment and social CSRs. Ireland's economic recovery, I think, is mirrored uh, in the changes to the CSRs from year to year. So four years ago, Ireland, we had just exited the Troika um, programme 
we just joined the mainstream semester process. And I think the emphasis of the social and the employment CSRs directed at Ireland then were on labour activation, and rightly so, we needed it, um, uh, particularly around our long-term unemployed um, sector. But more recently, the emphasis has shifted to a policy where the changes broadly agree with the tone and the substance of what the Commission are trying to implement in their proposals, which highlight the important issues um, that we recognise as priorities uh, in this area for action. And these include childcare, they include housing, they include digital skills, all very, very large and relevant issues um, that we're experiencing here in Ireland. And whilst these are important policy goals in themselves, the inclusion in the semester process relates to how improvements in each can create the context for sustainable employment and growth and social inclusion, which I think is vitally important. So I want to welcome the recognition by the Commission has expressed in its recycling this year's CSRs that Ireland's social protection and taxation systems are very effective in curtailing poverty and inequality. Equally, I want to challenge or welcome the challenges that existing Irish policies in such areas as social inclusion and childcare bring um, to our conversation because this type of external scrutiny uh, forces policymakers, um, and there's lots of us, and we all have inputs in it. It forces us to justify and to reevaluate existing policies, and I actually think that's a really good thing. Um, I'd like to say that there's a word here about the role of our social partners uh, in the process. There are several fora that exist in Ireland for regulatory consultations with our social partners, and a lot of them happen to come from my own department. And they include, from Pascal's perspective, the National Economic Council, the Labour and Employment Economic, uh, Economic Forum. But in my own department, we have our pre-budget uh, forum every year, which last year was my first one, was incredibly valuable in actually listening, not even just on a one-to-one -one perspective, but reflecting the shared view uh, across a number of bodies. And it genuinely did feed, and I hope you'll agree with me, that it did feed into some of the changes that we made with regard to last year's budgetary process. Um, the CSRs do not, of course, exist in a policy vacuum. In recent years, Member States and the Commission have worked together to raise the profile of social unemployment initiatives that ultimately improves every single citizen in the EU uh, their lives. But it reminds Europeans that there's more to Europe than what we've been consistently listening to for the last number of years um, of austerity uh, and excessive deficit procedures. It's lovely now to actually be talking about social policy progression, about improving people's lives, about the work-life balance, about improving, improving employment rights. The European pillar of social rights has led the way uh, on promoting a renewed social Europe. And I have to say we absolutely, thoroughly support the pillar throughout the process, publishing its own comprehensive response to the Commission's consultation. I think it's fair to say playing a leading role in the EU and ensuring the proclamation of the pillar of social rights was a document member states could stand over it and work with the Commission to implement it. And we don't have long uh, left in this Commission, so I think we have to work incredibly hard and smart over the coming months to make sure that we do implement it fully. I had the privilege of going to Sweden before Christmas to accompany the Taoiseach and to meet all of the other world or EU leaders that were there, uh, where the proclamation of the pillar of social rights was declared and adopted. And those political commitments were made with 20 distinct social and employment policy areas under three broad categories of equal opportunities and access to the labour market, fair working conditions, and the social protection and inclusion for all of our citizens were adopted. And I think the emphasis in Gothenburg was from learning from each other's experiences and using the proclamation as a guide for upward convergence. The history of the European Union is littered with proclamations that, once declared, are often forgotten. But actually, I think since last November, and we have a monthly meeting, obviously, and other less informal or more informal meetings uh, during the process. Um, it has been on the agenda every single month since last November. Uh, I think the emphasis has shifted very distinctly to the implementation of the pillar. Uh, our own Taoiseach has discussed implementation with the EU counterparts at two EU Council meetings, and I, as I said, have had discussions at every single Council meeting um, that we've had at EPSCO uh, every single month since last November. I think the implementation of the social pillar is happening. It's going to happen. We all recognise that it's something that we want and we're all going in the, the same direction. But we do genuinely uh, respect and reflect that not every EU country's economy uh, is the same as their neighbour. There are some economies that have more buoyancy than others, but we all want to make sure that we get to the same dynamic 
destination um, at the same time. I think the Commission has also worked to implement the social pillar into the semester process this year, including through the country-specific recommendations, which is very, very welcome, because indeed there are several policy areas where the Commission has not brought forward proposals for recommendations uh, or a directive, but it has genuinely proven uh, and chosen to advance the pillar uh, through the specifically targeted CSRs uh, as appropriate for member states, and I think that's really, uh, it shows a sign um, that the Commissioner is absolutely uh, intent on ensuring that we recognise Europe uh, as a socially inclusive uh, organisation and group of states as opposed to just uh, an economic and trade group. Uh, I'd like to say more recently, last March, the Commissioner launched the Social Fairness Package. Through distinct uh, from the social pillar, it's an underlying justification of the same and the objectives of the same because it's going to give impetus to a new social Europe and recognise that there are some European states that don't have uh, the same buoyancy as I've just spoken about as others do. And in addition to enhancing access to social protection, the package aims to process a new European Labour Authority which aims to streamline current initiatives and enhance cooperation between all of our member states. And whilst discussions between the member states are still at a very early stage, and I think we're all trying to kind of suss each other out, um, Ireland very much welcomes the proposal and we look forward to ensuring it does become an instrument that helps ensure workers' rights uh, and employees' rights across EU international bo or internal borders uh, in a way that we treat all workers fair uh, and in a just manner. <coughs> all these fine initiatives uh, and the CSRs wouldn't get very far without them. Uh, I think the CSRs are overwhelmingly financed by member states and the Commission has grown to understand that increasing funding and the capacity to absorb that funding can take time. The EU funding is also required to make sure that the European social um, idea is meaningful and it's not just a concept. As negotiations get underway on the multi-annual financial framework, I think we fully realise that social policies much fight uh, and compete with other policies, but we need to fight to make sure that we get adequate funding for the seven years post-2020. The Commission launched its proposals on the 2nd of May and it highlighted, and I quote, strengthening the social dimension of the Union, including through the full implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. And I very much welcome the Commissioner's ambition and I'm going to support her for as long as I'm here uh, and uh, the Director Juiced here in their efforts to secure the necessary funding to underpin the development and the maintenance of the key social and employment level uh, policies at EU level. And finally, before uh, the Director General speaks, I want to commend the Commission in partnering with its Member States in adopting what is actually a flexible approach to the semester process because we are committing to implementing incremental uh, improvements in the CR, uh, CSR process and working with Ireland towards the common goals of inclusive growth and social fairness. Um, I believe that the integration of the European Pillar of Social Rights into the CSR process this year demonstrates a continuing capacity for innovation and adaptation in the EU semester. The years ahead include significant challenges in relation to the EU budgets and social policy instruments, but well-established commitments to continuous reform and a firm vision that is laid down in the social pillar, I think is an excellent basis for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And our second keynote, keynote speaker is Joost Corte. I hope I've got that uh, reasonably okay. He's the top civil servant in the Director, European Commission's Director General for uh, Employment, um, Employment, Social Affairs, and Outreach. Dear Minister, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, at the Institute to discuss um, <clears throat> the latest developments in Brussels in the area of uh, social Europe, as uh, President Juncker always calls it, and in particular to uh, discuss with you the, the latest uh, proposals for country-specific recommendations that have been put forward by the Commission on the 23rd of May. The Minister already referred to it. Um, it's at any rate, I think, an important week, weeks, not only on the 23rd of May there were the, uh, the proposals for the uh, CSRs, the country specific recommendations, but this week we see the adoption of the Commission proposals for the cohesion um, um, uh, funds for the next MFF, for the next multi-annual financial framework, and uh, I think as we speak today, Commissioner Phil Hogan is presenting the proposals for the common agriculture policy. 
And of course, all these initiatives um, have will have a very considerable impact on, on Ireland. Um, and I think it's therefore important to, uh, <coughs> to reflect a bit on what's, what's happening. Um, I think the, to start with the European semester, I think the, uh, the catch phrase of President Juncker, uh, which he used I think, in the, uh, in the uh, State of the Union in September of last year, was that we should fix the roof while the sun is shining. And I think this captures rather well uh, the whole tenor, the whole concept of this year's uh, semester package. Um, uh, it means that we've had a very favorable economic um, uh, uh, situation at the moment. The European economy is growing at its fastest pace since a decade. And this means that we now have an opportunity to do some urgent structural reforms that have basically been perhaps a bit neglected for very good reasons because we were in a deep, in a deep financial and economic crisis. And I don't have to say this here in Dublin, you know much better than I what that means. Uh, but it does mean, mean that the, the, the package of this year and, uh, and the country's specific recommendation do have a very different flavor. They're much more forward-looking, uh, also taking a slightly longer time span, up to uh, 12 to 18 months for its implementation, and they, don't, they look a lot less backwards in issues like legacy issues of the crisis. So let's use this um, positive economic climate that we have at the moment uh, to do these necessary repairs. Also, because it may not, lo it may not last, the, the positive economic situation. I don't have to mention Brexit and its potential impact here. We also have um, to deal with President Trump and everything he's doing, which may very well impact on the economic situation in Europe. Then there is the situation in Italy and in other parts of the European Union, which are also going to impact on the, uh, on the growth perspectives. And I'd like to do. Um, I would like to say also and pick up what the minister said on the, um, the way in which the package this year, this European semester package was prepared um, by the Commission in, in very close cooperation with the Member States and also in very close cooperation with, with the social partners at the European level, but more importantly, I think, at the national level. And um, I think this means that probably this year's package will be, will be quite um, peaceful, if I may say so. My first indication from the process in the Council, where all these recommendations are obviously scrutinized and they have to be approved, um, the, 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 it goes rather well. And it, I think it just means that the preparations were good uh, and that we hopefully have found together with the United States, with the social partners, the right balance and come out with recommendations that are useful. It's not, we don't do these recommendations for us. They are done, of course, to help the government uh, in the countries to do the, the things that they um, probably would like to do anyway, and uh, which helps them to make a, a, a focus, to better, put a better focus on the really urgent issues. By and large, this also meant that the number of CSRs has gone down quite a bit. Uh, I think by about uh, 8 or 9 percent across the, um, the European Union, uh, and that they have become, as I said, a lot more focused. And what is also important is that if you look at the um, policies that the recommendations are targeting this year, there are more on the social Europe. This is a surprise, no, of course it's not a surprise, because again, as the Minister already indicated, last year the European Bill of Social Rights was declared uh, solemnly at Rothenburg, and hence uh, you, you cannot be surprised the Commission is uh, you know, taking that into account and that it has an impact on the way we uh, incorporate the principles of the Bill into the semester. And this has been done, I think, uh, quite um, uh, quite clearly, and you will you will see this back in also in your own in your own uh, country-specific recommendation. Um, so I think the process in Ireland has been uh, has been very good, and um, all stakeholders, uh, uh, notably the social parties and civil society, have really helped us a lot in coming up with the good proposals. Um, let me then also say uh, turn a bit um, into the specific recommendation that you will find. Uh, for Ireland uh, this year, there are two. There's one on childcare and there's one on digital skills. Those are the two uh, more CSRs for Ireland, but I would like to limit myself here to the ones for which I'm particularly responsible in the uh, social and employment area, and there are two. One is on childcare and the other is on uh, digital skills. Um, 
by and large, of course, every, all that I will say is done against a, a very favorable background. Because the Irish economy, you know, is much better than I do you as well. You are doing a lot better than others in terms of employment and, um, and also in terms of um, many of the other indicators that you see in the, in the social scoreboard, which is a very useful document uh, because it is through the social scoreboard, which you can find, of course, on the internet, um, that we, in a way, assess uh, that all the member states uh, in accordance with the principles of the social pillar. Uh, so that is also I think, a helpful tool to translate these principles, the principles of the social pillar, everybody can sign up to. But it gets interesting, exactly as the minister said, when we start comparing the states, how they actually perform against each and every other of these principles. And, you, and how, can we, how can we motivate the states in an area where the Commission and the European Union has very few competences to speak about, how can we motivate them to move upwards together, this concept of upward convergence. That's really our objective. Uh, let me then briefly speak about the two, uh, the two recommendations, affordable quality childcare, the first one, and the second one, as I said, digital upskill. Uh, accessibility to, to affordable full-time quality childcare is mean, very difficult, and um, it's, um, it's the most expensive one in this country in the whole of the European Union according to studies done by the OECD, for loan parents. And it's the second most expensive one for couples in the whole of the European Union. So that is, I think, apparently a fact. And of course, these factors do have a negative impact on women's employment, uh, which stood 65.4% uh, in Ireland in 2016. Now we know, of course, also, and this is also uh, duly uh, certified through uh, the country report and through the, uh, the country specific recommendation and the IRS clauses that the single affordable childcare scheme was approved here in December 2017. This is an important initiative that should now be very swiftly implemented. There was already a recommendation last year for uh, affordable childcare. There's another one this year, um, but I think you will see that the, the, the formulation is more optimistic because there is this piece of legislation that is now been adopted. And also the measures to attract more workers to the sector, the workers to actually do the job care, deserve praise. But <coughs> efforts must be sustained to cope with demographic pressures from very high birth rates. I think Ireland is among the highest birth rates uh, in the European Union. So this is why we felt it was important to maintain the CSR uh, on the on the job care. Secondly, digital skills. Um, Skills is a thing, if you look again more horizontally at all of the member states, all 27 that were assessed, Greece is not assessed because this is a different program, but normally we will take Greece on board again next year, again next year. Um, the skills shortages and the lack of uh, well-educated students coming out of university and schools is an issue that is, uh, we find everywhere in the European Union. It is really the priority of all priorities, I think, in the area of um, of uh, social policies uh, in the European Union. And it's also an issue here, because despite the, the very good employment creation record in Ireland, differences in the employment rates of low, medium and highly skilled workers remain among the highest in the European Union. And there is a feeling that it has to do with, it, with the lack of digital skills among certain quarters of the, uh, of the employment force. So Ireland still has one of the lowest levels of people of working age with basic digital skills in the European Union. It's actually 48%. But the EU average is 59%. Um, in the UK it's 71, and in my own country, the Netherlands, it's 79. This is very strange. I didn't ask one of my colleagues to check this is really correct, because this is not at all what you normally think of Ireland, of uh, where the working population doesn't have sufficient digital basic skills. Uh, but apparently these facts are as they are. And hence, again, uh, I think in full uh, harmony with everybody here, we thought that this is a, where you need a push. Uh, and therefore, we thought it was pertinent to issue a CSR uh, on the need to upskill your adult population in relation to digital skills. Um, now, the next steps will be, uh, as I said, that this is all going through the, through the council at the moment, through the various committees. It will go to the uh, council in, uh, in June, the EFSCO Council, and then ultimately will be approved by the European Council at the end of uh, June. 
Um, and then, of course, the implementation is fast. Much more important to implement than what's happening in the Brussels. It's, it's about the implementation, of course, that this is all, that this is all done. And um, we will then come back to the progress again in the next year's uh, cycle. Finally, um, a few words about the um, other issues that were brought forward over the last few weeks in Brussels, uh, in particular on the multi-annual financial framework. Um, of course, what is particularly relevant for us here in, in teaching employment in, in, in Brussels, and I suppose also for you and for the Minister, is that the um, ESF Plus regulation was put forward uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, sorry, on the 30th of May, um, as well as the European Globalization Adjustment Fund. Um, and I think just spend a bit of the time on this because it is important and it has to do again with, uh, with social Europe and with the linking up of the social pillar uh, to the funding side. You know, of course, that the EU budget discussions uh, will be very difficult this time around. Uh, a very big member state is going to sadly uh, leave us, and this means that the European Union will lose 15% of its GDP and the big net contributor. At the same time, um, the, um, the, the challenges are piling up, more and more new challenges. The world has become a much more dangerous place than it was uh, when this MFF started. And hence, um, the Commission um, has been looking for a reasonable compromise between those two, in the sense of a budget that is uh, ambitious, but still um, uh, should be acceptable for, for the Member States, and a diversion of the, the funds towards new, new priorities. Um, um, and that is what you will find in the, in the MFF proposal, um, which uh, is quite a note, and I've seen a lot of these MFFs coming, passing by, and I do think this time around it is actually uh, very different. It is very different in, um, in particular because it is a lot more flexible. Uh, the Commission proposes to make it much easier for Member States to uh, channel money from one fund to another in order to be able to respond quicker to un unexpected events. Uh, and of course, this is largely driven by our experience from the, uh, from the economic crisis and also from the, mig the migrant crisis, the refugee crisis, where it was extremely hard and difficult to swiftly respond, even though the, the funds are there. But once they've been programmed, it's very hard to channel them to other, maybe more priority uh, uh, tasks. So we, 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 we've introduced some mechanisms in this proposal, and we hope very much hope the state will, of course, endorse them. Um, for the ESF, um, so what we've done is uh, put forward a regulation which will be called the uh, European Social Fund Plus. Why is it why the plus? Because in fact it also incorporates uh, three other uh, regulations that are currently still separate. One regulation which will have um, the um, Youth Employment Initiative, the ESF itself of course, but then the Youth Employment Initiative, the European uh, Fund for the Most Deprived, uh, the Employment and Social Innovation Program, as well as the EU Health Program. Um, that is why it's called ESF Plus. And of course, the ESF Plus is part of the cohesion family, um, and therefore there are strong links between this fund and the cohesion fund and the European Regional Fund, but also with Erasmus and the European Solidarity Corps to achieve all the objectives in a, in a, in a harmonized and in a, in a logical way. And again here you will see that uh, the flexibility between the different funds has been enhanced substantially. I think up to 5% of each of these funds can be, can be moved around uh, by member states. Um, if we look at the size of the social fund, um, it uh, is 100 billion euros. This is the proposal that we made which is about 27% of the total cohesion envelope, which is more than it is today, because today is 23. And again, this is just, I think, a, a proof that uh, social Europe and um, uh, the, social, the Pillar of Social Rights is, take, is taken seriously by the Commission. Of course, all this still needs to be uh, approved. 27% uh, for, the, for the social fund in comparison to the other cohesion funds it's interesting to see that in Ireland, 
of your total cohesion in Europe, you spend 61% on, on, on the social fund. I think, I think Ireland is actually the highest, so there's only 30, 31%, 39% going to the regional fund. In other member states, you see a very different. So I think today the Irish government is already putting emphasis very largely on, on the social dimension of the cohesion fund. So I think this is uh, what, all I wanted to say um, by way uh, of introduction here. Um, I very much hope again that um, uh, I want to again say that from our point of view, the selection process has been an extremely successful one. I'm very happy, and I heard also today that in the council, so far uh, there doesn't seem to be any discussion about the Irish uh, recommendations. So that means uh, that the process has, been, has really worked very well. Um, and um, we very much hope, of course, that with, with the money, with the legislation that the European Commission is putting forward, and with the MFF proposal, that we do actually really help Ireland to overcome its remaining uh, um, uh, shortages. Thank you for the big business. Thank you very much. So we have now have two representatives from the social partners to respond, I suppose, to what's been said and asked about the their thoughts to it. So maybe we can kick off with Marie Sherlock, who's the chief partner. Thanks, Dan. And um, thanks very much for the invite here today. And I, I suppose I want to kind of combine my, my contribution to two sets of comments. Um, the first, I suppose, relates very much to the, the fiscal strategy for some of the recommendations that have been set out in, in the, the CSR. Um, some of those recommendations very much being linked to what we might call inclusive growth. Um, certainly, I think from uh, to the largest union in Ireland, very much welcome the, the particular focus on some of the key obstacles um, to inclusive growth, such as improving childcare provision, housing, public primary health care, and pensions. And certainly, that focus in, in the report is, is, is very welcome. Um, I think the other thing to say is that while we, uh, um, you know, for many years, the agenda has been dominated by one uh, of surrounding fiscal discipline and fiscal rules. Certainly, very much welcome the, 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 the shift in attention now to the social agenda. But of course, at the heart of all this discussion has to be um, a discussion about the fiscal strategy and how we pay for all that. We pay for all this because, of course, unless we have the money, then this conversation is doomed to go around in circles as it has for the past two decades about childcare, about health, about education in this country and not making much progress. Um, I suppose just acknowledge uh, just some of the detail that, um, that, that the European Commission has set out. So you know, they highlight constraints upon labour market participation from insufficient childcare supports, the shortage of access to housing and the negative spill over to employability, to productivity and of course to well-being from, from, from not having that dependable roof over the head the lack of capacity within the primary community healthcare system to meet the unmet need and growing needs that we're going to have over the next decade. And of course, a growing polarization in terms of the skills within the existing labor, labor force here in Ireland. And, and I suppose an increasing concern with regard to labor market resilience of certain cohorts in the labor market um, in being able to respond to uh, the jobs of the future and the challenges that are going to um, present uh, in, in the labour market over the coming decades. So all that is very welcome, but I suppose what I'm here today is I suppose to very much reflect a domestic concern, which is um, about how we pay for that. And there's two fundamental problems. Firstly, in the context of the government's own fiscal strategy, planned structural budget surpluses uh, over the medium term, and of course uh, tax cuts being, being part of that. It's not clear to me how we can accommodate these structural changes in public expenditure. And I suppose what has been spoken about here are not incremental uh, changes uh, to, uh, to, to public services. It's actually a shift of an increase in public services. So within health, for instance, a move into primary community care on a universal basis. Child care at the moment is supported only for a certain number of families in this country. Um, and for, uh, well, sorry, I suppose significant child care support is only for a small number of families. If we're to greatly broaden that, then there's going to have to be a shift to level increase in, in, in child care supports. And certainly in terms of education, we know that there's a huge issue with regards to third level funding. So if we are to deliver on that, 
um, then we need to have um, isobals, uh, as I would see it, a change uh, within the fiscal strategy as it ha has been articulated over the past two months, or two, sorry, two years by the subsistence government. We have an opportunity now to deliver, and within the, uh, the, 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 um, the fiscal rules, um, that expansion in public services. But I'm not saying it at the moment in terms of what's being articulated, particularly with regards to budget 2019. I think the second thing to say is that we need to also think about how we plan for these changes. And certainly we very much embraced the notion of multi-annual um, planning plans for capital expenditure. Of course, we had the publication of the National Development Plan um, just last month. But with regards to current planning, current expenditure, we've never had that multi-annual thinking. Yes, we have the ceilings, um, but I suppose that only allows for uh, incremental small-scale increases. We haven't had the um, multi-annual plans to be able to think about how we actually roll out changes in health or in education or in childcare or in housing. Um, and certainly when we think about the uh, trying to, 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 to bring with all that change within, it, I, I suppose, um, the next decade, which is a short period of time, that's a, an enormous amount of change. And certainly wiser heads than I around here may well remember a time when we had a, a period of change in so many fronts um, in previous decades. Certainly in my living memory, we haven't had that. But if we are to deliver change over the next decade in some of these areas, um, then we're going to need to think very carefully about how we deliver that um, within the, the, the fiscal constraints as we have them, but also, I suppose, utilizing the opportunities, the, 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 the fiscal opportunities as we now have them. Um, I think the second issue that I just want to touch on is the relationship between fiscal sustainability of our public services and the health of, of the labour market. And I suppose that's very much the heart of what has been spoken about within the, 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 the CSRs. Um, because if we think about it, in order to ensure the sustainability of our public finances, we need a very strong labour market. And to me, nowhere is this more evident than in the issue of pensions. Um, because if we, at the moment, we understand that we are going to have a significant issue with regards to sustainability of the pension liabilities of the state, uh, over, the, over the coming decades. And I suppose a very conventional, or what has been conventional to many Western European countries and indeed to Ireland is to increase the pension age. And Ireland is going to have the highest pension age uh, across advanced industrialized countries by 2028. But I, as I think we'd all appreciate, there is a limit to how many times we can increase the pension age. And we need to start thinking about other more innovative ways of ensuring the sustainability the fiscal sustainability of our pension liabilities in the coming decades. And for me, certainly a key thing that we need to look at is the employment rate. Because obviously, if we have more people at work, and a higher share of the working age population at work, then we're in a much better position to be able to sustain um, the pension system over the coming decades. And as we know, our employment rate relative to uh, other EU member states is certainly below um, far below what, what it should be. Um, I think there is a, you know, a, a great focus, and, and rightly so, on female labour market participation and the fall off after the age of 35, and certainly related to the childcare issues and other issues that have been spoken about here. But I think we also need to think about male employment, uh, and arguably there's been a permanent, sh uh, uh, a permanent uh, reduction in the male employment rate that has crashed up. No for a good reason, because there's more young men now going into education. But it certainly exposes an issue there that our employment rate um, uh, needs to be higher for both men and women. Uh, and we need to think about, uh, I, I suppose, um, initiatives specific to both males and females to improve that over the coming years, if we're to improve, the, the, uh, uh, to ensure that there's a greater number of people at work to sustain our higher dependency ratio in the coming decades. Um, I just want to conclude just on the um, just on the broader issue of, of, of the labour market. I suppose with the, the exception of the late 90s and early 2000s, we're going through the fastest period of employment growth uh, in, in the history of the state. And that's certainly very much to be welcomed. But I think thankfully we're moving from a we're shifting from a place of just talking about the number of people at work to the quantity of jobs now. Um, and, uh, and, and that has been touched upon 
um, in the CSRs with regards to uh, the, the work intensity of some households. We know that there's um, the slightly, uh, well, I, 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 I suppose it's within the context of, of quality work, but we know that there's just under one in five people in this country who wake up at work, it would wake up every morning uh, to some sort of job insecurity. Um, so a smaller number, um, I suppose we could define as being precarious, about 175,000. Uh, but nonetheless, a very significant number in terms of actually how we ensure that those people have a decent deal to be able to sustain um, themselves and their families um, in, into the future. Uh, and I suppose I just want to acknowledge the efforts of the, department, the, the Minister's Department in terms of the, the Employment Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which is currently being worked at, and of course, uh, I, I suppose the, uh, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, indeed my own union, sit to and mandate um, having, um, I suppose, a, an input uh, or, or certainly making their, their views very clear with regards to that legislation. We look forward to further progress on that. But I, I suppose uh, certainly this is this is something that we're going to um, have to watch very care carefully with regards to precarious work that is not as big an issue here in Ireland uh, as it is in other countries. But presumably, if we're going to follow other EU member state trends, it's going to get bigger into the future. So I think that legislation will be certainly very important. The last thing to say is that um, uh, the European Union in particular um, has played a huge part um, in terms of the gender equality uh, debate and agenda um, in this country over the past four decades. Upon going on five, four decades. Um, and I suppose looking to the future, um, I think it can have a very real impact on reducing gender inequality and, in particular, the gender pay gap in this country. And I think all too often we focus on childcare as being one of the, the chief features of the gender pay gap, but we know it's only one feature. Um, so we've spoken about childcare today, but I think there's two other things. The second is in terms of pay transparency. And I think certainly the EU can bring an awful lot more pressure and um, encouragement to bear on countries like Ireland to uh, improve pay transparency uh, because I think that will have a very significant impact on reducing the gender pay gap because we know as women progress through the labour market um, in terms of how they, um, uh, in, in terms of rising up their career ladder. The, 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 uh, the, the pay is certainly um, the, the pay increases are less relative to, to what men get when, when, when they are promoted. And the last thing is with regards to fair work conditions. And I suppose certainly it's something that we're delighted to see in terms of the proposals with regards to the EU Labour Authority and the other proposals for fair work. And that will certainly have a real impact on women at work because we know that there's more women than men in lower paid sectors in more precarious and certainly much more vulnerable uh, in the workplace. So, thank you. Thanks, uh, Marie. And our final panelist is Tony Donaghy, the Head of Education and Social Policy at the Employers' Organisation, I bet. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, add our thoughts to this discussion. Um, the CSR has got three groups of recommendations. I suppose we broadly agree with the thrust of them. Uh, you've heard them explain to us. I suppose we have different emphasis in some of the priorities. Um, there is a lot of uh, material on the need for Ireland to accelerate its uh, debt reduction. We would actually argue that in terms of expenditure, the fundamentals of the economy are very sound at the moment. And it's important to address those rapidly emerging bottlenecks like uh, labor, skills, housing, etc. And this, we do have the opportunity. Uh, the uh, recommendations also talk about the timely implementation of the uh, National Development Plan, Projects Ireland 2040. Again, we think that's where the emphasis of expenditure should be. But, uh, today we're really looking around the social aspects of the CSR. I'm just going to look at uh, four main areas very quickly. The first one is that of lifelong learning, upskilling and digital skills. 
So the digital skills figures feel a bit uh, counterintuitive to me. I don't understand why we're so out of uh, sync, particularly with the UK, where we share a lot of cultural differences. But uh, a group that I'm involved with, the expert group on future skills needs, will be looking at that and trying to understand that a bit more. We do have an issue around lifelong learning rates, which are low. And I think the challenge here is to actually create the demand the demand amongst employees and citizens, but also amongst employers. And a key to that is how we use the national expenditure, uh, the national training fund, which employers pay into. Indeed, their contribution increased in the last budget and is due to increase in the next two budgets. We know how some of that money is used on things like apprenticeships, which we're uh, very much in favour of. But there's vast tranches of that 500 million fund, which we're not really clear on the outcomes from. There's a review of that at the moment, and uh, we'd like to see that brought to fruition. Um, because those skill uh, gaps are, are developing into wider labor market shortages. Marie also mentioned pensions. Um, and the government on Monday uh, launched its pensions roadmap, uh, which the minister declared a passion for pensions. I'm the other person in the room who's got a passion for pensions, probably because I'm a bit closer to market. But uh, I, um, I think it's a very good document. I think uh, the five strands of it, uh, the first strand was launched on Monday, and that's around this total contributions uh, approach, which I think instinctively feels the right thing to do. It seems more equitable, there's been a lot of coverage to that. But probably the most challenging aspect of this pensions roadmap is the introduction of, of a auto-enrolled <coughs> occupational pension uh, scheme. At the moment, only 35% of workers actually have private occupational pensions. That is a serious issue. We're an outlier in the OECD in that regard. But a lot of very careful planning and design will need to go into coming up with a system that uh, has the confidence of both employers who have signed up in principle to contribute into it and also employees and the government. Um, thankfully, because there's a, there's a danger in these sort of processes that interdepartmental committees uh, hand down the design of these programs, Thankfully, there's been a proposal that this would be part of the deliberations of the Labour Employer Economic Forum. Um, incidentally, uh, other areas that it's looking at or will look at are housing, childcare and employment rights. It's nice to see social dialogue, which is so much a European concept, is beginning to return, albeit in a nascent way, into Ireland. It's something that was very much out of favour during the uh, crisis and probably unfairly blamed for some of our ills. So it's good to have a structure where employees and employers who have a vested interest in this have a direct say in the governance and the design of this program. Childcare uh, has been talked about a lot. Um, just to say, you know, everybody knows the, uh, the reasons why childcare is so important in terms of, amongst a whole range of issues, uh, labour market uh, participation for females. But this has to be paid for, and it's very expensive. And the Commissioner pointed out, and the document points out, that we've got the second most expensive childcare for couples and the first for lone parents in the EU. We've also got the highest rate of cash transfers in terms of the child benefit uh, in the EU. So, sorry, we're second to Luxembourg. So, uh, we can't have both. Quite simple. We can't have high rates of child benefits and well designed childcare provision. And it was lazy policy making that chose the cash transfer route in the past. And some of those, uh, uh, some of the unintended consequences, we've got 330 million, for example, going to households with income of over 100,000 uh, a year. And we could make significant uh, savings, if we means tested the child benefits, something that politicians are very averse to even consider, uh, and invest that into childcare provision. Um, housing, uh, very complex issue. I'll just say that we need uh, 36,000 units on average up to 2046. This peaks at 56,000. We built 17,000 last year. This is very complicated around 
cost of development land site value tax, our planning system, uh, investment incentives for landlords, uh, disconnections between government departments, but it's probably the issue that our member companies speak about more than anything else. Um, I want to uh, end this input uh, um, urging the Commission to revisit a notion that was very popular back in 2008 uh, before the crisis uh, hit, and that's the one of flexicurity. This idea that we invest in people rather than jobs that may become redundant due to demographics, due to technology, due to globalization, a whole range of factors. We know that there is such a churn in the jobs markets. We might may not like aspects of it. It's a reality, though. So we need to invest in people. We need to look at this future workplace. and. We need to come up with the social protection systems that ease these transitions. We also need to invest heavily in lifelong learning so that people can reskill uh, as they move from job to job. And I would suggest that that is probably a, um, a more constructive way of approaching this whole issue of so-called precarious employment. And uh, rather than some of the uh, Broadly, we support the social pillar, but it also contains seven new directives. We've already got 70 directives covering the uh, employment relationship emanating from Europe. We've got 14 bills making their way through the Oireachtas as we speak around the employment relationship. I don't think regulation is going to solve this issue. We need to acknowledge the realities and, and put together a new framework which is suitable for that uh, workplace of the future. Thank you.